uh, we are very excited about the paper. Um, so maybe you can start sharing your screen, but before sharing your screen, would it be possible if you just introduce yourself briefly? Uh, yes. Uh, my name is uh, Ingela Farmrid. I'm currently working at the University of Gothenburg, where I have a research group that study um, membrane nanodomains and membrane topography. My background is in uh, biochemistry, but I slowly moved towards uh, cell biology, and I'm now actually in a medical uh, faculty. Thank you, Ingela. So you can start sharing your screen. Is that working all right? Yeah. Okay, shall we go? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so today I will talk to you uh, mainly about a recent publication that was published this year in uh, August in Frontiers in Cell and Developmental Biology. And this is a joint project between uh, um, my group from Gothenburg University, where we also have Sven Jöran Eriksson. Uh, we got help from the Sci Life Lab facility for imaging in Stockholm, where we have Stefan Wellman. And we collaborated uh, with a group of Patrick Hapel in uh, Ruhr University at Bochum in Germany. And in his group, we also have Philip Hagemann and Astrid Gesper. And Asper, Astrid is the lead author of this um, publication. So what we're dealing with is diffusion in membranes. So I thought I'll start to talk a little bit about um, what can differ between diffusion in the plasma membrane and in a model membrane. So what's been found quite a long time ago now is that if you look at diffusion in cell membranes, and that's mainly the plasma membrane, it is about 10 times slower than if you look at diffusion in model membranes. And over time, people have tried to come up with different explanations for this difference. Uh, one uh, that could uh, ex perhaps explain this is membrane asymmetry. Um, Nowadays, there are techniques for making asymmetric model membranes, but most studies have so far been performed on uh, symmetric uh, membranes. And we know now that this actually does affect the behavior of molecules in membranes. So in the plasma membrane, we have quite an uneven distribution of lipids, where we find uh, the negatively charged lipids, uh, phosphoinositides and phosphatidylserine in the cytoplasmic leaflets, where we also find PE phosphatidyl at the Whereas um, phosphatidyl choline is quite evenly distributed between the two, and you find the bulk of single myelin in the outer leaflet, where you also find all the glycosylated lipids because they form part of the gly glycocalyx. So if you don't maintain this asymmetry, it does affect uh, the behavior of molecules. But of course, this is not the only uh, possible explanation. We have the membrane nanodomains. Uh, also widely known as lipid rafts, uh, where we have a heterogeneity in the lipid packing in the plasma membrane. So you can say that these are the biology version of ordered membrane domains. So the lipid rafts have a tighter packing, uh, more extended uh, uh, chains uh, than the rest of the membrane. And you also have interdigitation between lipids. And to form an ordered uh, membrane phase or a lipid draft, you need sterols and in the mammalian cells that would be uh, cholesterol. So of course, if there, there is heterogeneity in the lipid packing, that will affect diffusion of molecules because they will then have a preference for either the more ordered or the more disordered membrane domain. Uh, so what else can we have? Um, we can have physical barriers and um, this is a model uh, promoted by uh, uh, Aki Kusumi. Uh, when you look at the plasma membrane from the inside, we have a lot of uh, cytoskeletal fibers going in all directions. And these form some uh, a compartmentalization of the plasma membrane. And by joining uh, to transmembrane proteins, this can limit the diffusion. So you get what's called confined diffusion in this meshwork of uh, actin filaments. So all these perhaps already were familiar to you, but I'm going to introduce a new one, and that could be cell topography. They can also 
be the explanation behind this 10 times slower uh, diffusion in the plasma membrane. So what do we know about cell topography? And I think that differs a lot depending on what discipline we're from. If we come from cell biology, we're quite used to see pictures like this in textbooks. And this is demonstrating a migrating, mi migrating cell. And you see philopodia, lamellipodia. And so therefore cell biologists will probably not think of cells as very flat. But if you come from other disciplines, perhaps you have not come across images like this. And then you will uh, tend to make the assumption that the membrane is flat. And of course, also making this assumption will make all your uh, calculations uh, on diffusion a lot more simple. So what did we do? Um, we were using uh, a technique called fluorescence correlation spectroscopy, um, which can be used to study the diffusional behavior of molecules, both, both in solution and in membranes. In our case, we were looking at the uh, uh, apical side of cells that were attached to glass, so the upper part of the cells that you see uh, top left in this image. And what you do is that you have a focal volume, and in this volume you have fluctuation of fluorescence, and you look at the uh, correlation of these fluctuations over time, and from that you can estimate a lot of um, parameters, and the one we've been looking at is uh, called tau d, which is the transit time. So it's the average time a molecule will spend in the uh, focal volume. So there has been a lot of studies on FCS in cell membranes that report widely different uh, transit times uh, between different cells, but also within uh, cells. Uh, and when they're looking at in the membrane, so we thought maybe systematically, this depends on where in the cell membrane you are looking at the diffusion. So we set out to um, look at either um, the uh, nuclear uh, part of the plasma membrane is on top of the nucleus or the part that is on top of the cytoplasm. And to explain the focal volume, we have uh, this to the left. Uh, we see what will happen in the flat membrane and also the FCS um, mathematics are built upon the membrane being fat, flat for the autocorrelation or autovariance function to work. But of course, if the membrane isn't flat, but have topographical features, there will be more membrane in the focal volume than the flat assumption says. So this will have an effect on the um, transit times. So looking at cells, in our case, we were looking at epithelial uh, colon cancer cells. Uh, we decided to systematically look at two positions. One would be at the very peak of these cells, so that we call on top or above the nucleus. And we were looking midway between the top of the cell and the edge of the cell in the direction where the cell had spread the most. And this we call above the cytoplasm. And we can see a very clear trend in the transit times in that the diffusion appeared to be faster on top of the nucleus than it was above the cytoplasm. Uh, so this was a consistent uh, finding. So we went on um, to see what um, could be behind this. And then we teamed up with um, the group in Germany because they are working with something called ion conductance microscopy. This is a surface scanning um, methodology. And uh, you may be familiar to atomic force microscopy. You can say this is similar, but it is non-touching. And non-touching is very important when you're working with mammalian cells because they are very soft. So if you're working with AM AFM, there is a tendency to actually flatten the cells with the tip you use. But in ionic conductance microscopy, uh, Instead, you're using non-touching. So you have a pipette that is filled with uh, ionic solution. And when that comes close to the surface, uh, the currents in and out of the pipette will vary. The pipette will stop and it will sense uh, the surface. And like AFM, it can be used in two modes. You can either scan the surface, as you see to the left, or you can do this like in tapping or hopping mode, mo mode where you uh, retract the pipette uh, between each position. Uh, in this paper that I'm presenting now, we used it in the scanning mode. Uh, 
So looking at the same type of cell that we've done um, the fluorescence correlation spectro spectro spectroscopy in, uh, we can see uh, a typical cell um, in different uh, modes of display in this image. Uh, at the top, we can see a height image. Of course, the cell will have a global height uh, and curvature uh, because it will be the highest where the nucleus is uh, in an adherent cell. But it will also have um, a roughness that differs across um, the cell surface. And in order to calculate this uh, roughness, a method was developed taking advantage of the slope. So the slope being how much uh, does the height change in any position uh, of the surface? And from this, you can get uh, a calculation of the surface uh, roughness. So uh, the line drawn on the slope is the line we see on the right where we have the height profile. Uh, and then we can see, well, it, it will seem to be smoother over uh, the top of the cell where there are more peaks when you come uh, away from the nucleus. And this, uh, we were looking at at uh, a total of uh, 31 cells and came up with uh, a measurement. So we were looking at the roughness at the 19th percentile uh, of the values. And we divided the cells into 10 groups, starting from the highest position and then going equidistances for each cell uh, to the uh, longer spread uh, direction and dividing it into 10 groups. And doing this, uh, we could see that the roughness actually was higher the further away from the nucleus you will get. So on top of the nucleus was uh, the smoothest position of the plasma membrane, and this goes well in line with the findings of the diffusion in fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. So we have a match between the way the cells look and the way uh, membrane molecules behave. And I should mention the molecule we were looking at was a membrane dye and its diffusion in the membrane, the dye DII. So could we combine this somehow? We have the roughness information and we can simulate what will happen in FCS. So that will be the next step. So we have the surface that can um, be converted um, to a grid and then you can look at diffusion and taking into account the, the 3D uh, elements, the topography of the cell. And uh, in the middle here, you see a track of a molecule diffusing in 3D. And at the bottom, you see what's very often done, or what will be done if you assume that your cell is flat. Uh, you will actually collapse the track in 2D. And this is somewhat problematic because membrane molecules have a tendency to stay in the membrane. It doesn't matter if they are lipids or proteins, just leaving the membrane um, would not just be allowed. So we will look at this uh, little illustration. You can see that if you collapse the track, you actually will allow the molecule to leave the membrane. And physically, physically that will not happen. So instead, you need to look at something called the shortest winning surface distance that the molecule can move. Um, and this is something uh, going back that we, when we started looking at topography, actually did. So we had high resolution topography images uh, of fixed cells, and we simulated diffusion in different areas. In a topography image like this, the whiter, the more uh, topographical features. So in, in a whitish area, there's a lot of things going on on the cell surface, when, whereas a dark area is reasonably flat. So in region one here, uh, is more, more flat and in region two, we have more topographical features. And uh, looking at DREL as we call it, uh, which is compared to what the diffusion would have been if it was a flat surface, we find that in this region number two, um, the, the diffusion was actually only one fourth of what it would be. So these topographical features caused a um, change in the diffusion of about four. And I mentioned earlier that we are somewhere around 10. So we're approaching um, the explanation. And we think that topography 
um, uh, mapping using uh, ion conductance microscopy doesn't, of course, give us the entire picture because of the resolution. We do miss fine features, but also we miss all the indentations. So are there cavioli or clattering coated pits? They will not be seen. So all the things sticking out of, of the um, cell will be picked up by this technology. technology. So it might well be that we are closer uh, than this. Uh, interestingly, if you do simulations, uh, think, considering the topography, if you, for instance, imagine pillars, and pillars can represent uh, protrusions like microvilli touching another cell or a surface, uh, you find this uh, interesting feature as if you collapse the track uh, to a 2D track, when the molecule is moving up and down the pillars, it will appear to not move very much at all. So it appears to be trapped. Uh, so there's some sort of border. Uh, and when it comes to the top of a pillar, the diffusion again is fr more free as it is also between the pillars. So this uh, has clear elements of something that is called uh, hop diffusion and that is um, explained by the um, fences that I showed you earlier, the physical barriers. Uh, but what these simulations show that you can also get features of hope diffusion if you have a varied topography in your cell. So back to our um, uh, FCS measurements and modeling. Uh, so we were looking at different regions uh, along the line. They're marked one, two, and three in the top of the image and uh, simulated diffusion at different positions. And this is what you see uh, further down. So in these three re regions, the top uh, region one uh, uh, at the top of the nucleus where we have a reasonably smooth membrane and region two and three away from the nucleus where there are more topographical features. Uh, we can also see that at region one, it doesn't make a big difference if we uh, shift the uh, center for the FCS volume slightly. It's very even transit times throughout um, um, the whole region. Whereas in the other two regions, it's very much dependent on where exactly you start, uh, uh, where you center your um, FCS. Uh, and that's because you have these enormous slope uh, changes close to one another, giving it a higher roughness. So, uh, so how does this uh, relate to the diffusional um, uh, behavior ensemble? And then there's something called the FCS uh, diffusion laws. And uh, there are a lot of them, but I will mainly talk about Brownian diffusion. So Brownian diffusion is when molecules move randomly. There, there is nothing other than molecular mo movement going on. And then the FCS diffusion law states that there is a linear relationship between the observation volume, in this case, uh, the focal volume of FCS and the diffusion time. So if you have any deviation from this linear relationship, this indicates that the diffusion is non-Brownian, and that's also called anonymous diffusion. And there's a lot of anomalous diffusion being described in the literature, and a lot of models for the um, plasma membrane actually are derived from uh, these measurements. But what they all have in common, or most of them at least so far, is that they are assuming that the membrane is flat. So, um, Taking it one step further with our simulations, uh, we uh, picked um, 14 positions of the cell and did the spot size variation uh, modeled FCS on these uh, different positions. And um, we could see that not in a single position, not even at the top of the nucleus, uh, was there a linear relationship between the spot size and um, the transit time for the molecules. So uh, this clearly uh, tells us that the topography um, uh, gives us the reporting of anonymous diffusion, although that it, it was Brownian motion that is simulated in, in these experiments. So is there anything we can do to uh, 
to sort of um, compensate or estimate what is the membrane contribution and what could actually be other reasons for the anonymous diffusion. And yes, we had an idea that maybe you can use uh, a membrane marker to do this. So if you know how much membrane there is in your focal volume, uh, then you can compensate for this if you're looking at the uh, diffusion for something else. So what we first tried um, uh, was uh, using the DII and the different proteins. And we had uh, various proteins and various cell types. And uh, Okay, uh, I forgot to tell you at this point, you're probably going to say, oh, but you're looking at FCS at the top side of the cell. Everyone knows that that's very uh, difficult. But of course, also at the uh, basal side of cells, the cells are not flat. These are EM images, and but this has also been showed by variable angle um, microscopy. And when the cells are fixed, they are more flat than when they're alive. So live cells come and go, also touching the cover slips. You have a much greater variation uh, in the topography of the live cells and FCS tend to be performed on live cells. So going back then to our um, membrane dye, which is plotted here uh, in the x-axis as the intensity of the II, uh, DID um, membrane probe and what, we did was looking at the intensity as the start of the FCS measurements because there is a tendency of bleaching throughout. So this is the initial intensity at the start of the experiment. And then we were looking at the transit time of the proteins and did a linear regression model where we were looking at, um, at this in different cell types and with different proteins. Now she mentioned that the proteins we used were both transmembrane and lipid anchored proteins. And we can see the same trend that the membrane intensity at the start of the experiment uh, was very well matched with the uh, variation in transit time. And the slope 0.77 tells us that, that, that for one unit in uh, intensity, uh, there's 0.77 units in change in transit time. So it's, it doesn't explain everything, but it explains a lot. And the um, squared R value for the whole mo model is 0.83, and that tells you how much the whole model explained. And the whole model uh, contain contained also variations in um, uh, cell type, uh, protein type, and individual cells. So why doesn't it explain everything? Does it mean that the rest I'll say the 23% are uh, from non-topography um, variations. Well, we're not sure about that because it also depends on the actual topography. So it can still definitely explain the bulk, but it's possible that it uh, even explains more. So some um, other things related to topography is that when you do not have a flat membrane and trying to do diffusion uh, studies, uh, I know that the membrane does not have squares, but when you do diffusions, you tend to form some sort of grid. And when there are features that stick out or are indented, you will actually end up with uh, pixels, voxels that have either three or five neighbors. The usual would be that there are four, that's what they will have in a flat membrane. But when they have three or five, this could cause sub and super diffusion itself. Because if there are only three neighbors, well, the molecules will spread on three instead of four. So you will have super diffusion. And when there are five neighbors, you will have the other, you will have sub diffusion because the spread will be to more pixels than in a flat membrane. So this is another consequence uh, that the topography will have on diffusion. And I, I will just mention uh, some other features of topography that can actually um, influence the way we interpret data. Um, another one being how we look at how uh, molecular interactions, how to interpret them. Because if we realize that the membrane is folded, we can actually have interactions uh, in cis that is within the same plasma membrane, either by receptors and their ligands, or perhaps uh, other types of proteins, adhesion molecules. So it opens up uh, possibilities that we are not generally considering. Um, 
And of course, another issue is that the molecules may not be as close in space as you may think, because if you have a line of protrusions, uh, for instance, uh, coated with receptors at uh, their tips, uh, these in space will be quite long uh, distance away from one another. That is also illustrated in this image um, that is looking what happens to um, uh, particle tracking. What you tend to do is attach something rarely big to something very small. Uh, usually this will be a nanogold uh, particle. And yes, for one, two, and three, the actual distance between them is, uh, if you look at it in 2D, very close to what they are. But if we start looking at five and six, if you look at them in 2D, you will think they are in the same position. You will think that five and seven are very close, but actually there's a lot of membrane between them. So there, there are things that need to be considered uh, when you start thinking about the folding of a membrane. Another thing that um, should be considered is the way we think about clustering, because this is often studied with a technology called TURF, um, uh, Total Internal Reflectance uh, Imaging. And what you do is that you're looking at the uh, very uh, bottom of a cell that is attached to a cover slip. And this is a simulation uh, where we uh, simulate pillars, protrusions, being what's touching uh, the cover slip first. And uh, you have a membrane marker. And just because the accumulation of membrane uh, where these pillars will touch the surface, it will look it appear clustered. It will appear to be clustered. And uh, the only thing that's happened is that there's actually more membrane there. So um, having this in mind when talking about uh, clustering, uh, I would say that there probably isn't as much uh, clustering going on as, pre as so far has been reported. So what did we conclude in this paper? Well, we've been looking at plasma membrane topography and we see that it affects diffusion in the plasma membrane. And it also gives the appearance of being anomalous. Uh, we have also seen that the topographical features are not evenly distributed over the cell surface. Uh, we found that over the nucleus, it's actually rather flat, flattish, whereas uh, towards the edge of the cell, uh, the further you go, the more topographical features you actually find. And we also conclude uh, that if you have a membrane marker and look at the intensity for your FCS, uh, you can actually uh, see how much of the variations that you will see in FCS measurements are attributed to topography variation and how much is uh, attributed to perhaps other reasons for anomalous diffusion. And again, I would like to thank my co-workers and facility and um, people that uh, contributed to this work are all mentioned here. Jan Soros, Jeremy Adler and Sven Jan Eriksson that work uh, with me. Um, and um, we have lot, done a lot of ion conductance imaging and Pavel Novak, Andrei Shevchuk, Yuri Korshev were on the first study. Uh, uh, joint work with Bjorn Erfeldt on the consequences on topography. Ida Maria Sinton and Robin Strand for diffusion measurements. Stefan Wellman for um, FCS and the group in Germany, Astrid uh, Gesper, Philipp Hagemann, Patrick Happel for uh, their ion conductance. Uh, measurements and simulations. And I thank my funders and all of you who watched, and I'll be happy to try to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Angela. Beautiful talk. And um, I think this is something that we have always ignored. And uh, now I think it's becoming more and more clear that we cannot ignore this anymore. So I, I think I'll go for the first question now. So now what you're talking about, the topology differences you're talking about is basically microscopic. But now if you imagine, you mentioned, you just touched upon that actually there are also nanoscopic nanoscale um, topologies like caveoli or very small invagination or protrusions. And what we are doing, for instance, is stead FCS. And I wouldn't be surprised that this small uh, topological Features can actually bias our state FCS measurements, especially if there is some sort of sorting due to curvature. What Absolutely. would you think about this? 
Um, I, I think it's been demonstrated that there is sorting um, because of the shape of lipids. All lipids do not like all curvature. Some lipids prefer um, the more flat regions, whereas other have more con conical or inverted conical shape and therefore will uh, prefer either inwards or outward curvature. And this is probably true for proteins too, but we do not have as many studies yet. But I would say high curvature will be harder for proteins to pass than a flat membrane. And the second question, so th this measurement should be done, right? So the FCS measurements, you said now your measurements are basically on the top membrane and in the close, close to, let's say the nucleus and then far away from nucleus. And you also said the basal membrane is also uh, not really flat. So if, do you have any comparison, how flat would be the basal membrane compared to this really ruffled rough membrane on top? Uh, it's definitely flatter. Uh, and the image I showed was from electron microscopy. And if you fix the cell, it will become flatter. But um, what we have seen, we've also been doing high resolution imaging of, of live cells, that the membrane comes and goes uh, also at the bottom of the cell. So the cell is moving around and uh, areas that are close to the cell, uh, the cover slip will, will differ over time. Um, and there can be quite, uh, I mean, several hundred uh, nanometers uh, distances in, in like crypts where there is no cell at all. So there's a lot of movement going on also on, on that side. Thank you very much. So um, I'll ask some questions from the audience. Snig uh, Dhadev Das is asking, the membrane marker that you're using is C12DAI. If different fatty acid chain length and the unsaturation is used, that the diffusion change would be the function of topology as well? Um, so, so we actually used two different uh, dyes in, in the study. We had the IIC12, but then we used also the ID with, with a longer uh, acyl chain, and we could not see any um, typical difference between the two. And both as far as we know, are reasonably good markers for the entire membrane. So they, they will also not have a preferential uh, um, partitioning to uh, rafts or non-raft domains. So uh, in line with this, actually, I, I was also wondering if it was, it would be a difference be between raft and non-raft markers because the intensity control that you're, me you're mentioning, mm -hmm. it makes total sense if the probe actually doesn't go one way or the other. But if let's say the probe is somehow excluded from some ordered domains, then the intensity can actually screw your measurements, right? Because now uh, if you're yes. relying on the intensity, the probe may not be one way or the other. What do you think? So yeah, I mean, that could explain, help explaining why we didn't see a hundred percent correlation between transit times and uh, topography, but there could be uh, other uh, reasons as well. And I think also a problem with the membrane probes, which we did observe, if we let the experiment go on for a long time, we have a lot of internalization of the probe. And given that the focal volume of FCS is quite big, you do go also into the cytoplasm, so you can catch up on ER membranes, vesicles, and other membranes that are close. So uh, what we did was doing the experiments quite quickly after staining, so we did not uh, encounter a lot of internalization. But of course, that will also affect your measurements. Thank you very much, Ingela. So another audience question, Eje Erol is asking, actin filaments can regulate the membrane topography. Considering the role of actin filaments in lipid rafts, can membrane topography help form lipid rafts? Uh, interesting questions. There, there have been some suggestions that curvature are involved in, in forming lipid rafts. And, and uh, another line of research that we've been looking at is uh, something called pinning, where you transiently immobilize uh, uh, a membrane component. And what we have seen that you can immobilize uh, like actin filaments, so increasing their number and uh, attachment to the plasma membrane, you actually do get more uh, uh, ordered membrane. So that's in line with sort of actin touching and transient immobilization sort of creates or help creating, shifting the balance towards the LO domain. So they can absolutely be involved. But in those experiments, we could not assess curvature. Mm 
Thank you. So Patrick Happel actually makes a comment for the state FCS part. He says, by the way, we simulated state FCS and the effect of the topography is even larger since you average over a much smaller area, which I would probably expect as well. So Anne Kenworth is asking, since the cytoskeleton is presumably driving the differences in membrane topography, do you think that is also contributing to the differences in diffusion at different regions? Uh, definitely. Uh, we do not think there are so many um, active filaments per uh, protrusion mic microvilli over the nucleus. There seems to be a flatter area uh, and those sorts of features is what you see uh, further away from the nucleus. Correct. And related question about this, how the topo this topographical features are formed. Uh, Christina is asking, is it possible to examine whether the signal signaling pathways occurring in the cell cytoplasm cause topographical changes on the cell membrane? Ah, but yes, I think you're touching on a very important issue there because when we are reporting changes in diffusion due to signaling or treatment with drugs or anything, I think it's very important that we are making sure that we're not seeing changes in topography. So we're actually seeing changes in, in diffusion. And that, uh, so yes, it may well happen that they change the way the cell organizes and how many uh, microvilli they are and that in cell will affect the topography. I think similarly, probably mm -hmm. it would be correct the other way around. The topography can actually help the signaling due to Absolutely, because of cis interactions or something else and yeah. scanning the environment. Okay, so one more question, Ingela, from me. Um, now we're talking about FCS. Maybe I should take the attention to other technologies that would actually suffer from this as well. So you mentioned briefly that actually FRET, the, the proximity of two molecules mm. can actually be also influenced by this. So the FRET, FRET measurements can also be biased by this. Is that correct? Yes. FRAP measurements can also be biased with this because the recovery wouldn't so, be... So I mean, yeah, anything where you're trying to assess diffusion. Uh, okay. But, but good, also good. FRAP, yeah. It's great, isn't it? Yeah, you're not making our lives easier. <laughs> okay, another question is by Bethil Kirkley, uh, again about the topographical differences. Molecular interactions and co-diffusion rates vary at different temperatures. Could possible change in temperature can change the molecular topography and the diffusion coefficient changes because of this? Uh, I would say yes. If you take your cells to a very cold temperature, uh, like around zero degrees, uh, we work a lot with uh, T cells and they actually round up and because they're not so active anymore, forming new per protrusions, uh, they become uh, rounder. So temperature does affect this. And I perhaps you mentioned that our studies were also performed at room temperature. And you said when you fix the cells, everything becomes flatter. Uh, the bottom side definitely does. And mm -hmm. I would say the top side will collapse a bit because there's a little space where there's a lot of water and that will just collapse down on the nearest cytoskeletal uh, feature. Thanks, Ingela. Next question is by Irem Kullu. She is asking, uh, you're using HD29 cells. If a different type of cell were used, would there be a big change in results? No, we do not think so. In, in our first study, when we started looking at topography, we actually uh, scanned 70 different uh, cell types and we could not find a single one that was flat. They were all very similar and had lots of uh, topographical features. Thank and you. In, so... in the last experiments that I talked about when we, we used the membrane marker to compensate, it was actually from three different uh, cell lines, uh, two being adherent and one being uh, a immune cell. Another question about this topographical future and probably the cell biology of it. Can the ion flow created by the ion channels in the lipid membrane with the FCS method have an effect on the topography features, the topography measurements? Uh, can you go, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Yeah, can the ion flow created by the ion channels in the lipid membrane with the FCS method have an effect on the topography measurements? I guess I, I don't understand. There are no ions, ion flows created by the FCS. No, no. But, but I think what I understand from ah. this question is: Would ion ion channel activity yeah. somehow create topographical differences that would actually change the FCS measurements? Okay, um, I must say I do not know, but I would say it's possible, definitely. I think this is definitely oh. a whole lot of field why mm. this um, 
the membrane ruffles form. Yeah, I think actin is definitely one of the big players, but there I mean, are a lot of yeah, other... I mean, yeah, calcium changes is likely exactly. to to affect processes. Uh, about the FREP measurements that we discussed before, um, if I don't know if modeling would be easy to model a recovery curve in a flat membrane versus with some pillars, for instance, if you see single component recovery or multi-component recovery, do you think this is feasible and easy? Uh, uh, I wouldn't say easy um, because again, in the cell, you have all the uh, complications with internal membranes and you can get delivery as well, not only recovery, but uh, if we simplify the model, I say it would be possible to look at FRAP as well. Okay, Patrick comments on one of the questions. I'm not sure which one. Uh, he says, uh, this is something we are looking at for years. At least cell swelling is known in the brain after uh, storm activity. So could be so, the ions perhaps? Yeah, mm. could be. Yeah, so um, I don't see any more questions by the audience anymore. It was fantastic. Thanks for making our lives more difficult, Ingela. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's really great to see all these effects. And now I think um, it's more and more obvious that we should just, uh, we cannot ignore this fact anymore. No, let's help each other solve it so, so that we can be better. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much. So uh, thanks for joining us again. There are actually a few more questions, but I think I will send those questions to you later. Okay. Uh, by email if you want okay thanks a lot for joining us again it thank was you. a wonderful talk thank you and um i'll see you around <laughs>